Hello, this is my video over the final for my English class in college. For this project, I went over the transcendentalism in poetry because it is well, it's important. First, we need to understand how the written words relate to transcendentalism. So, the first thing we need to do is define transcendentalism. I can't pronounce that word. So, the definition of transcendentalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the a priori conditions of knowledge and experience or the unknowable character of unlimited ultimate ultimate reality or that emphasize the transcendent as a fundamental reality i got that definition from miriam webster dictionary online it's linked in the paper all right but i didn't understand that definition because i didn't understand everything in that definition one of them was what's a priori i didn't know so i went back to marion webster because why not and got the definition for that which means it is a deductive or relating to or derived by reasoning from self-evident propositions i think in this case we would be using the um derived by reasoning from self-evident propositions because transcendentalism is supposed to be about individualism whatnot and then we should understand what transcendent means because that's part of the word transcendentalism i'm sorry i can't really say it so transcendent means it exceeds usual limits surpassing or exceeding or lying beyond the limits of ordinary experience or being beyond the limits of all possible experience and knowledge okay so that that's a lot <laughs> and if anyone's like me it still got just a little confusing so we need to figure out how those two definitions work with the definition of transcendentalism. I'm trying. So, if we put those definitions together with transcendent being beyond the limits of all possible experience and knowledge and priori or a priori not sure, is um, derived by reasoning from self-evident propositions, we can figure this out. And that's, if we combined them, the definition would be a philosophy that emphasizes the deductive or derived by reasoning from self-evident propositions conditions of knowledge and experience or the unknowable character of ultimate oh, yeah ultimate reality or that emphasize the being beyond the limits of all possible experience and knowledge as a fundamental reality that's still quite a lot and to try and put it in more 
layman's terms, that's basically the, a fundamental reality in transcendentalism and what they wanted in the their movement, the transcendent, I don't remember what their movement was called, had the word transcendent in it. Let's go with that. <laughs> but that it's got the fundamental reality of being unique and having one's own self, one's own thoughts and learning for oneself, not learning for, or not just like following a crowd. It wanted you to be unique. It wanted you to develop your own thoughts, your own ideas, and to come to your own conclusion, but not disregarding anybody else's thoughts or ideas. So, it, I mean, makes sense to me. So now, how does that tie into poetry? Well, I used Emily Dickinson. She's a pretty famous poet. <laughs> I don't think I need to give her biography. But the first poem I used to represent transcendentalism was the to be alive is power. I forget the number that it was because she never actually titled her poems. Anyway, let me quote it for you. To be alive is power. Existence in itself without a further function omnipotence enough to be alive and will. Tis able as a god, the maker of ourselves, to be such being finitude. Yeah. So, we can take the points that she makes here, like the maker of ourselves. He's saying that we can shape ourselves, shape our beliefs, and that being alive is power. And to have that power, you have a will. And you can use that will to create or to learn and grow or to come up with your own ideas. The second poem I used is poem 260 or I'm nobody who are you this one is pretty famous I think I mean I heard it before my class so I say that's pretty famous <laughs> in my little world anyways so let's quote this one for you it says I'm nobody who are you are you nobody too then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'll advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog. To tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. This poem has a lot with the transcendentalism because on well, the first line, I'm nobody, with an exclamation mark. She's proud, very proud to be nobody, because in her mind, it didn't matter if you were somebody. You didn't have to be famous. You didn't have to be well-known. You didn't have to be connected. You could be a nobody in the world and still have your own ideas, your own thoughts. And then when she saw or met somebody else, she got excited, thinking that, you know, they were nobody too. They weren't anybody important. They weren't anybody famous. But they still had their own unique ideas. And you can tell also how not bad she thinks it is, but like dreary. Well, she says dreary. But how, how boring, how troublesome, that's a good word, it would be to be somebody 
I mean, she just describes it like being a frog where you have to do things and say things to make people admire you. The admiring bog is how she would describe the, the people that would fall in your every word because you're famous or you're well known, even though that wouldn't make your ideas any better than some nobody in her words. And I, I really like that. I agree with that a lot because I think especially in today's time, we do seem to um, hold those who we see as famous, like, you know, actors, musicians, and we hold their opinion higher, even though their opinion doesn't really matter in that sense, because you should each have your own opinion and come up with your own thoughts. And for me, that's how this poetry works with transcendentalism. Thank you.